I actually wish I I understood this earlier on because I rarely, rarely train my arms now. Mm. Be, I would just much rather do a bench press or a row or a pull up, um, so I could hit a bigger muscle group. I'm going to burn more calories. I'm going to target a bigger muscle group that makes a bigger difference on my physique. And in addition to that, I'm still getting a good good work on my buys and my tries. Yeah, I just didn't understand that before. Now, granted, if I really wanted to continue to have the same size arms as I did probably in my, my twenties. And I would also do a lot of isolation work in addition to that. Yeah. But actually I think my physique is more balanced by doing less of the isolation work that I used to do so much of, and just making sure that I stay consistent. That's a hundred percent. All right. Here's something controversial. Some of the best exercises for your arms are actually Back and chest exercises. Ooh. That's right. Say what? I know. You know, it's- All uh, CrossFitters and gymnasts totally agree with this. They understand. Statement. You know what's funny uh, about yeah. this? When we talk about the lower extremities, everybody agrees. So if I said the best exercise for your quads is not leg extensions, it's squats. Or the mm -hmm. best exercise for your butt is not, you know, one-legged hip thrust, but rather a barbell hip thrust or barbell squats. Everybody be like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh -huh. But then when you get to biceps and triceps, and I say, hey, the best exercise for your biceps overall, by the way, I'm not saying there's no value in all the other exercises. There definitely is. But if I say the best exercise for biceps is like a supinated grip, you know, curl grip, chin up, uh -huh. Or the best exercise for your tricep is a close grip, put you know, bench press or well, you're dips. really firing up the bros right now. I know they're like, no, it's <laughs> tricep extensions. I and curls. I actually wish I I understood this earlier on because I rarely rarely train my arms now. Mm. Be, I would just much rather do a bench press or a row or a pull up, um, so I could hit a bigger muscle group. I'm going to burn more calories. I'm going to target a bigger muscle group that makes a bigger difference on my physique. And in addition to that, I'm still getting a good good work on my buys and my tries. Yeah. I just didn't understand that before. Now, granted, if I really wanted to continue to have the same size arms as I did probably in my my 20s, then I would also do a lot of isolation work in addition to that. Yeah. But actually, I think my physique is more balanced by doing less of the isolation work that I used to do so much of and just making sure that I stay consistent. That's 100% because people are going to confuse this and be like, no, you got to have curls. You got to have tricep extensions. Yeah, yeah. For a complete routine, you want to include those things. Just like you want to do some isolation exercises for your hamstrings and your quads, like the example I gave earlier. But if you were to pick one exercise for your biceps or one exercise for triceps and you really want to develop them and get strong and get the most bang for your buck. It's usually compound lifts and yeah. it's the same thing that you would see with the lower body. So, and it took me a long time to, you know, when I started to figure this out, I got in a competition with one of my trainers years ago with the close grip bench press. So he was able to close grip bench press. I don't remember how much the weight was, but it was a lot. And he's like, I bet you can't do that. And so I went on this mission of being able to, to, to match him with the close grip. And I couldn't believe how much my triceps developed. I stopped doing tricep extensions. Yeah, yep. I stopped doing cable press downs and all that stuff because I was just trying to get stronger with the close grip. And I was like, wow, look at my triceps grow from not isolating them, which was pretty crazy. And the same thing for biceps. Like if you, if you take a bar and you take the supinated grip and you pull yourself straight up, like you're trying to curl yourself up. So with, with, when you're doing it for your back, you want to stick your chest out and kind of squeeze it back. But if you really curl with the biceps, and it's hard, by the way, you're not going to be able to do very many reps, yeah. your biceps will get, you will see some development in your biceps that just regular curls isn't going to be able to compa compare with. Oh, I, the same thing with my triceps, but just like going into super depth with my dips was just like, it unlocked a whole new potential there for my triceps of growth. And it was like... <clears throat> I think too a lot of the, the the backlash for this is like because of the difficulty of some of these compound lifts yeah. and, and where uh, some people have uh, a fight in them about it is just because like they they can they can get a lot of volume and they can um, they can attempt some of these easier uh, machine based type exercise to isolate uh, and they see a good pump afterwards. But uh, if you try the compound lift, you know that's the kind of muscle development that's going to build and stick and not just you know get that temporary pump. As well. I was just watching a clip from our good friend Jordan Shallow on his uh, his podcast. He had a buddy of his. I don't I don't I wasn't familiar with the guy. Um, but a friend of his on there and they were, he said five exercises, um, give me five exercises. You can't do anything else the rest of your life. What five exercises? And he actually goes, I don't need five, just three. And he said a lunge, a dip, 
and a pull up. Yeah. It, and that's a good choices. And I underneath it, I said I I don't disagree with this yeah, statement. Yeah. Like I and no, it, it's not the perfect routine. But no, you're limiting him to just and he three. said that, and Jordan said, well, for argument's sake, add two more in yeah. there. And he added, I forget, a hinge. I think he added in there a deadlift or something yeah, like that. that. Sort of covers and an overhead just the press basis. or a lateral raise or something, right? I think he put in there to add to those. But you know, those three movements uh, hit the entire body so well and pretty damn balanced that you'd be surprised on a decent physique that you would, if you have nutrition in line. And you train that those three movements consistently for years. You have a good physique. I, dude. I knew I knew a guy yeah. who spent years in, in prison. I don't remember how many years, three or four years. And uh, I ended up hiring him. And he had an incredible physique. And I said, "Oh man, you must have lifted weights like crazy in prison. You look pretty built." You know, nice guy by the way. I love this guy. He ended up becoming a trainer later. And he said, "No, actually, they took the the weights out of the gyms. I don't know a lot of people don't know this, but in California, a long time ago." They took the weights out of the gyms. Terrible idea, by the way. Stupid thing. Stupid thinking. But they're like, oh, the inmates, we don't want them to be so big and strong. Blah blah blah. So they took them out. And what he what they what he he did have was pull up bars, and he did pull ups and dips on the pull up bar and lunges, walking lunges. That's how he built his body. Yep. Just doing those you know those three exercises. But yeah, it's funny. <clears throat> name besides the biceps and triceps. Name a body part where if we were to list the top two or three exercises, they would be isolation movements. Like shoulders. Everyone's going to be like overhead press. Mm -hmm. yeah. Back, it's going to be a row or a pull-up. Chest, it's going to be some kind of a press. Legs, it's some type of a squat, right? Hamstrings, some kind of a deadlift. No other muscle groups do we pick an isolation movement as the best muscle-building movement. And yet, when it comes to biceps and triceps, for some reason, mm -hmm. we have this belief... Part of it, I think, is because we don't think of those, we don't label those other exercises as arm exercises. So if I say, yeah. you know, bench press or overhead press, I never say it's for triceps, right? If I say rows or pull-ups, I never say it's for biceps. I think that's part of the reason well, why, but I it think, is kind of confusing. I think part of it, too, is because those isolation exercises do lend themselves really well for that in comparison to those big muscles you're saying. Sure. Like isolation exercises really suck for glutes or quads or like, like those those exercises do not lend themselves as well. Concentration curls are still really good. Sure. You know, preacher curls are still really good for building the bicep. I just think that to your point, you're missing out on a compound lift. You know, where this matters, I think, or where this, in, at least in my lifting career, this, this information would have mattered the most for me was for sure in the early years. So I was the, t the typical teenage boy. Oh, you just spent too much time on the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. buys and try. Like yeah. if, I, if I was going to the beach with my buddies or if I hadn't trained in a while and I was just going to get a quick workout in, we always went and did arms. I'd go in there and do bicep curls and try some push yeah. downs like that. Those same situations happen to me today as a 40-year-old man where I only have a little bit of time or I haven't done anything in a while. Just, but now it's always going to be a pull-up. It's always going to be a squat. It's always going to be a bench press. It's always going to be a, It's going to be one of those. If I'm only going to go to the gym and do mm -hmm. a, a little bit of something or I haven't been in the gym for a while and I'm going to go in, I'm never going to do just buys and tries. Mm -hmm. Like I would never do that anymore. It's such a waste of time in my mind. Uh, for the same amount of time in there, I could get the same buy and tries, you know, pump or look or whatever it is that I'm trying to achieve by that isolation workout by doing a couple compound lifts, which I also am going to get the benefits of chest and back and butt and all the other stuff. Totally. Yeah. Like a perfect routine obviously is going to include a combination of things. Um, and I think for most people, compound lift focus is probably best. Uh, for your workouts, unless you're like super, super advanced and there's some specific things that you're you're doing, but otherwise compound lift focused, but most people run into the issue of time. Like you said, Adam, yeah. most people, you know, when I used to train clients, uh, these were people who, you know, if I could get them to work out twice a week, it was a win. And if they're going to come to the gym and go twice a week, I'm, I'm going to say, look, don't spend your time doing these, these isolation movements. We're only here twice a week. I want to get you better at these compound lifts. And the progress they got was phenomenal doing that. Now they had a third day in there and then we could throw in some isolation work as well and so on. You work out five days a week, fine. Now you have room to do all this other stuff. But a lot of people, especially in the beginning of their lifting career who are trying to develop their limbs or their, their arms, like get good at these compound lifts and, and watch what happens. It's like, a, a, you know, you get good at a, a curl grip pull up. I mean, in my experience, that's like, that's like three isolation exercises combined in terms of the results. Now, again, you put them together You've got kind of that that perfect routine, but uh, we don't consider the compound lifts near the top of best arm exercises, which to me is silly. I mean, you, I, I know it's not fair to you know 
single out a single person and say, oh, well, look at this example. But I mean, it's such a good example when you see somebody like a Ben Pollock, right? Who, yeah. I, if you go back and look at his Instagram thread for the last five years, I I don't think you've ever seen him do an isolation exercise. And it's well, like he was that, a power lifter, no? I was very yeah, like rare. he, you, I maybe you could count like five times out of a thousand or two thousand posts where that guy has done some sort of an isolation exercise. And look how balanced his physique, look how big his biceps, his mm -hmm. triceps are. Like yeah. amazing physique, literally just mastering the compound lifts and doing them and progressing them over and over Bro, and over for gym, years. Gymnasts have some of the biggest biceps for their body weight that you'll ever see. Yeah, you ask ridiculous. a gymnast where they get their big ass biceps from and they'll tell you it's the Iron Cross, right? Is that the one where they suspend themselves? Mm -hmm. They'll say, oh, the bicep tension on that is insane. I'm just holding myself. So that's an isometric. Well, what's the second one? Oh, lots of pull-ups. Do you guys do any curls? Eh, not really. I've done it a few times. I've had a couple gymnasts work for me and I'd ask them about their arm routines and, uh, and they're like, well, I, I barely ever do curls. I do lots of dips, pull-ups, and iron cross exercises, and that makes your arms just, just constantly put them through like the most tense <laughs> positions you possibly can. Like their whole body is lit up when they do those exercises, especially with the rings. So, um, yeah, that's so much body control and, and uh, intensity in, in that style of training. And again, it, it just produces it, it's interesting to see like um, it's exactly what a lot of the guys are doing in the gym with the isolation movements are trying to achieve that type of physique, but yeah. they're doing it just by, you know, doing pull-ups and, and dips. So funny. You know. What's up, everybody? I'm going to give away another program. You might be wondering why I do this so often. It's because we love you. Also, because I want you to leave comments. That helps us with the algorithm. So you want Mavs Powerlift? That's the one I'm giving away today. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, then subscribe to this channel, then turn on notifications. If you do all of those things and we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section, so make sure you check, and then you'll win free access to MAPS Powerlift. Also, got a sale going on right now. One of our workout program bundles is on sale, and one of our individual workout programs is on sale. So here's what they are. The bundle is the Shredded Summer Bundle. That includes MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So that whole thing is 50% off. And then the individual program that's on sale is MAPS Hit. So this is high-intensity interval training. That program is 50% off. So go check them out. Sign up. Here's where you go. Uh, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. And then the code that you use for the discount is June 50. June 50, no space, for that 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. Anyway, I uh, read an interesting study on optimism and its connection to lifespan. So these studies are typically tough because optimistic people tend to also have better habits. And so it's hard, it's hard to, you know, you got to rule things out and control for things, right? Like optimistic people are probably less likely to self-medicate with foods or drugs or alcohol, more likely to be active, more likely to seek social interaction, which we all know are, are all, you know, positively correlated with longer lifespan. But mm. this particular study, they did a pretty good job of, of controlling for all those things. And they found that just being somewhat optimistic was, and when I say somewhat, I don't mean like the most optimistic person in the world, but people who tend to view things from a half glass full, people who tend to, you know, attach purpose and meaning to challenge in their lives, that kind of stuff, they live longer. And, they, and this was a really, really interesting study. People who just have that mindset live longer, which is really cool. Well, I, that's one of my favorite quotes is, you know, whether you believe you can or can't, you're probably right. Mm -hmm. Right. I just think that's so true. I mean, before you can achieve something great, whether that be a championship, living longer, getting super strong, getting on, whatever it may be, you have to first believe it. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're, you're never going to get there if you doubt it and say you won't or you can't. So the to me like it's nece it's absolutely necessary. There may be exceptions to the rule or anomalies or or luck that happens to certain people, but if you're going to uh, try to achieve anything in your life, you first have to start with the belief that you can. And if you don't, you won't. It's that simple. I feel yeah, like. it's almost like even if you're fake and if you get put the reps in, it's pumping that self belief up, and you're just like constantly working on that uh, to to get to places where. I mean, you have to have that inevitably to to be able to even achieve those those things that you're you're seeking not, out. Yeah, not I, to not to mention, what a better way to live. Yeah. Oh yeah, same circumstances. Yeah. Except I view things from a I'm learning. There's meaning behind this. What can I pick up from this? Or a, 
oh my God, this sucks. I can't have no control. Everything, everything in my life, good and bad, happens for me, mm -hmm. not to me. That is so such a powerful way to to frame your life and so important to I think of how fulfilling and how good it is because everybody has shit. Everybody has a hard time. There's always going to be trials and tribulations that's going to happen throughout your entire life. Like nobody has a quote unquote easy life, no matter what you think. Okay. No matter what they make it look like. But literally how you look at it and you and you receive that. I think matters so much. Yeah, I had, I had a really good mentor uh, when I was younger who it was a client of mine and he was like this, like super optimistic. And at that time when I was a kid, I said, yeah, but um, you know, you got to be realistic too. Like you can't always win. You can't always succeed. And he goes, no, you're totally confused. He said, Sal, that's not how I'm optimistic. My optimism is, of course, I believe I can do something, but if I don't, I have the self-belief that I'll get back up. Mm -hmm. And that I'll be okay and that I'll try again. I was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. Because the confusion I had was, well, how can you how can you always think you're going to do everything all the time right when that's impossible? That's not how life works. It's not. It's like, you know nothing's going to be perfect. You know that. But you know also you're going to be okay. You'll figure it out and you'll derive meaning from it. That's the that's what's the definition he gave me and it made a huge impact. Well, it's interesting you bring this topic up because it kind of goes into something that I was going to bring up with belief in general and how powerful it is. And we've had people on the show like Dr. Roy Von Tagma, I think his name is, yeah. who you know is a doctor, but he really leaned heavily on that optimism with his patients mm. to have even better uh, results uh, and success stories with going through cancer and all these different treatments. Well. Uh, there's this new like documentary on on Netflix, and they believe it's called John of God, but it's apparently it's about this this healer who I've heard down, of this guy down in Brazil, and uh, it, it, it's somewhat tied into to Catholicism, but it's more of like the spiritualism of it, and so they kind of pray to like the the you know the different saints, and then he sort of channels. He's like a, a medium, so he kind of channels uh, these saints, and and it, he's. It, it, it is kind of one of those trippy things where like there's been a lot of cases where people's um, you know cancer has has reversed and turned benign and um, there's been tumors that have been able to be sort of extracted out with these really like raw ways of like surgical processes where they just cut you know out tissue of their body and like it's like it's as, as an observer on the outside you're like what is this quackery and what is this going on but then you start thinking about it you start thinking about people's own belief system and how powerful like anecdote we we know about or not anecdote uh, uh placebo we know about right you have it, to account for it the placebo, placebo effect, and you have to, yes you have yeah. to account for it in studies so it's a it's a real thing Right now, now imagine like that placebo effect could be ramped up even like more substantially because your belief in it is so powerful. Uh, it, it, so I just I personally trip out on that in terms of like people that fully fully believe like I'm getting better. I'm gonna get like and then you have this sort of uh, uh, a mystical side of it that's kind of tied into to that. Like that has to play a big factor. Uh, and maybe it's not so much of a spiritual thing as much as it's like I this think, belief system. I think Oprah did a thing on him a long she time ago. She went down there. Yeah. yeah and there's well, been, they've tried to study this guy, if I'm not mistaken. Well, yeah. there's research to support that. We just had the, we just had that conversation with, uh, what's Kelly's last name? She talked about the, uh, the glucose monitors. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Levesque. Okay. Levesque. 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 Thank you. And how that can affect your. Yeah. Your, remember your, she did, yeah. she did the, like, she referenced the study on there where they've actually, you believing your diet works for you actually ends up impacting you. And we and they've measured that enough to show that like how important that is. So if it matters there, it's got to matter almost look, anywhere else. Look, dude. people who are yeah. like skeptical about this, like you have to. Okay, this is where it gets silly to me. Okay, can you believe that you're a dragon and turn into a dragon? No, I don't think so. However, it's a fact that what you believe or what you think affects your physiology. That's a fact. Yeah. If you're stressed out or you're angry or you're excited or you're happy, does your physiology react and respond to that? Absolutely. So can you believe that you're feeling better and then your body's physiology change to the point where you actually feel better? Mm -hmm. Studies have to account for the placebo effect. They have to because it's a real thing. If they don't, then our studies can be thrown off. And there's been some weird stuff out. There was a study on 
knee surgery where they literally took yeah. people with yeah. MRIs that had knee problems. It was a fucked up study. Half of them they cut and sewed back up, did nothing. The other half they actually did surgery. Equal results on both sides. Yeah, unbeknownst to them. Yeah. yeah. Now, does, it, does that mean surgeries don't work? No, but I think it does highlight that there's something very interesting. Highlights the power of the well, mind. Yeah. And there's a lot of that too. Like now imagine that magnified because you're around a bunch of people in that same kind of belief where it's like it's, it's that group flow where everybody's in the same kind of uh, uh, energy that we're feeding off of each other. I do have to bring up though with this whole document the dark side of it, which is a whole part. Oh, like right, so the cults it, it, inevitably, right? Like it turns into sex, and and, and, <laughs> and then he fucks it all up because he starts banging, you know, some of the uh, people that come down there for help. Uh, singles out the did he do the that? attractive women? Yes. Oh, which he, is just like ah, oh, dude. Of course, you yeah. know, it's just like a human flaw. But but you see this a lot with people that do really really good things, and all of a sudden you find out this darkness. Dude, that's yeah. the bane of power, man. The yeah. bane of power and influence. It corrupts, doesn't yeah. it? But it's like I still it's trip also out what, on the on the actual like success. It's yeah. like, whoa, how did these people get Well, what sucks success? about that too is it ends up discrediting the success yes, from it's it just be gone. because of that. You know, oh, right away. All it's of like, it's bullshit. Yeah, all of it's bullshit. I, know. I mean, I think it's so arrogant of us when we we completely denounce something like that when we there's still there's, you know how much we don't know about the brain? Like we're like we're like barely we're barely there with like did really you, fully grasping what you know the brain is capable of doing. They've observed <laughs> yeah. okay, they've observed quantum phenomena in microtubules in the brain, meaning that consciousness may, this is speculation, may actually be derived from quantum phenomena that's happening in the brain. If you know anything about quantum physics, it's freaking weird it's really weird. <laughs> doesn't make any sense yeah, so just to highlight how little out. yeah how little we it's know. the same thing when i get mad about how we, we we talk in absolutes about nutrition when we know very little about the gut still like when we talk about absolutes with like where we're going after all this shit with the universe and like we don't even know where the end of it is like it's like Dude. we get we get so arrogant because we've pieced together some pretty good science over a hundred years well and now all of a sudden we fucking think we well, know everything you, have, <laughs> well, you know what it yeah. is okay you know what and, and they're uh, medicine's getting better at this. So I think in, in probably 20 or 30 years, we're going to be pretty good at this. But we separate the physiological that happens from the experience of what happens. And that's humans are not one or the other. We're both. So an example would be pain, for example. This is like Western medicine. This is what's wrong with Western medicine. We separate parts of the body as if it works like in isolation. Yeah, we're, we're really good at that, right? We, di we dive in really deep and then we discredit. We don't look at anything else. And you get to get a bunch of doctors communicate together or work with for one person is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. But like, like pain is a good example. I have a physio. We can measure the physiological things that are happening with pain. We can measure that. We can see that there's a signal going on with the central nervous system. We can see there's inflammatory chemicals that are going, the swelling, all that stuff. But then there's the experience of the pain. Okay, that is total. That is the subjective part that makes it hurt or not hurt. Like there's people. I don't have to say this. People know this. There's people that get sexual satisfaction from pain. The same, I could go in there and be like, this sucks, this hurts. Other people are like, yeah, yeah do it more. I like it. Yeah. What is that? That's the experience. Yeah. That's the experience part. I'm just Whips using an extreme, excite me. An extreme, <laughs> extreme <laughs> example. <laughs> so, <laughs> good stuff. It's, all, it's all good stuff. And I saw, yes, the, op, the, the study with the optimism, I think, makes a huge difference. And yeah. they show this, by the way, those studies on, um, like, not on in, inmates, but around that where, if people feel like they have some autonomy, it's not nearly as challenging or stressful if they think they have at least some control. And I know that there's been POWs who've written about this, and they said that the key to their survival was breaking the day up into fragments and, get, and giving themselves a sense of autonomy. Yeah, because otherwise you feel like you just you have no control, and that was the that was the most torturous you know part of the whole thing. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of the stuff that um, I bring up on the show, I get from a couple of newsletters that I read, The Hustle and then uh, Morning Brew. And I haven't been lately uh, because I've been so deep in the the real estate stuff right now. So I'm reading more on that than I and probably ever. Uh, so I haven't been. But I opened up this morning and I was reading uh, Morning Brew and uh, Organifi advertising there now. And this is now, really? I think this is the sixth company that we've partnered with that we, we obviously were working with for some time and that I've now seen either pop up in the morning brew or hustle. So it's so cool to see our brands that we're going to fight just continues to explode. Yeah. They're totally crushing. Yeah. They, right now. I, I'd be interesting to see where they're at. It's been a while since we've uh, talked to them and actually what I love is that they're very transparent. Oh, about you just wait, man. We've been working on a, a little supplement together. Yeah. 
I can't wait to release it. People, they, I tried it. I liked it. Are they giving you guys dates on it? I mean, what's the... No, you, no I don't have a date so yet. I but I tried the sample and I really liked it. I really liked uh, how it felt. So I'm not, I can't give too much detail because it's a secret. Secret yeah, I formula. liked it too. I tried it. Yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah. It was a good feeling. I haven't tried it yet. I got yeah. my my little my little, well, drug, my little drug bag over here. Right oh, is that what that is? Yeah. I was worried to ask yeah. you what that was. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's got my, like, my little drug bag. You mix bag. it in water, Adam. Okay. Oh, that's how, you oh that's how I take yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, I was like, where's yeah. the razor blade? He oh, come on, dude. dude. <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, yeah. last night I'm at dinner with my kids. And uh, okay, so I told you guys how Jessica is like super. She'll answer anything and be super open about anything. So, and my kids know this now, my older ones. They love to test it. And so I'm so uncomfortable, <laughs> dude. Oh, I'll be like, oh, why are you asking? And I know she's going to answer them. And I'm just, I'm trying to sit there and not react. But la the other night we got into drugs and they're asking about drugs. How do people use cocaine? And Jessica's like, well, they don't. oh, do they use credit cards for real to cut? Cause they see movies and stuff. Yeah. What about razor blades? Well, okay. you know, this is what, and I'm just so, so uncomfortable. I'm like, dude. Oh. Cause I never had like, if a conversation like that happened in my house when I was a kid, either my dad would have thrown me through the window or my mom would have started crying. Like it wouldn't have, it, it, it yeah. would, no way. Yeah, we just no way. avoided all those conversations yeah, dude. growing up. I know. Now, I, yeah. And I'm, I'm same with you. Like my, especially with my oldest, he'll, he'll ask me a lot about drugs. And, and ironically, uh, the other day, and I was going to bring this up. Um, so at our new house, like in the closet, um, he actually was like just looking around with his friend. He found this this box. This is like this old like um, it wasn't like World War II, but it looked like a kind of a survival kit, kind of a a, a box that was like you know like military kind of like, almost like, like a great place for a stash. Yeah, like so. <laughs> so there, dude. So you say that? And, oh no! Um, and so what was in there was you know some survival stuff and. Uh, uh, rations and you know all that kind of like military stuff but then also in there was like these old old pills and they were methamphetamines what dude, or am amphetamines yeah. yes where did you get this was who is this was your grandfather this was left no no f from the previous owner whoa yeah so they left bonus this, and it was <laughs> <laughs> they're a little old so i, I, I don't know if it's oh, what's, be, yeah, how long do they hold, last hold its uh uh weight but you had a lot of i was just tripping out I'm like who <laughs> leaves like this it, it was totally like finding like an un, undiscovered little little treasure how do you know they were amphetamines did they label it says it on i'll actually i'll put the picture up for andrew but i took a picture bro of it. It that like, is wild yeah. pink um uh pill so, so what do you like, guys what do you guys out. think are what are some of the biggest mistakes that parents make when discussing or not discussing drugs with their kids? Because eventually every parent has to has to deal I with this. I think one of the big mistakes that I still have challenges with is because, and here's why it's a mistake, what I'm about to say. They're going to talk to their friends. They're mm -hmm. going to go on the internet yeah. and they're going to have their own experiences. So you should be honest yeah, because right. what happens is if you paint some kind of picture and then they learn something that's different than what you said, they stop believing you or confiding in you. Right. The so conversation you, stops. So you got to be point. really balanced and honest. Yeah. So th this is a hard one for me because I did not grow up talking about the shit with my parents at all. And what I want to do is make it taboo or be like, oh, drugs, don't do them, you know, or whatever. They're so right? bad or they suck. Yeah. They so and so I'm trying to be honest. And so I'm like, well, here's why people do them. They obviously feel good. This is what happens. Here's some of the pitfalls that can happen. And then I'll try and connect it to other things. You know, this happens with food too, where some people they overeat um, and they use that as a drug and this can happen with gambling. And so, the, and so I, I, I try to be honest. I end up, what happens though, is I end up turning into um, like preachy Sal, where I start teaching, yeah. you know, like, let me teach you a little bit about, here's our today's special on whatever. <laughs> Jessica's way better at it. She's like super cool, doesn't react, has good conversations. So thank God I have, it's such a weird thing for me to talk about. You know? Yeah, it's it's tough because like I'll say uh, something to Ethan and then, you know, inevitably it gets passed down to Everett. I'm like, we're not having that conversation yet. You know, like you have to understand I'm having this conversation just with you right now because of your age and like what your life experience is right now with your circle of friends and like what everybody's talking about in junior high. I'm like, this is not an Everett conversation bud yeah. you know like let's keep him out of the loop yeah. uh, at least <laughs> give me some opportunity yeah, yeah. Uh, to have those conversations with him individually but um yeah it's been that's been a tough one because it is he's in that 
he's in that seriously impressionable uh, time where like, I mean, junior high is just a total shit show. Oh, it's the worst. It's, it's like everybody is yep. just trying to figure things out and like trying to be cool about it too, which is even worse. Yep. Yeah. You know, and they're just braggadocious about like their knowledge or whatever they, so I, again, to your point, like it's, it's the honesty. It's like, you know, this is what they actually do. And this is why some people like seek it out and, but I always give them the extreme case of like, if it's, it becomes like an addiction, like where this leads and where this path of life could take you. And like, yeah. so the cautionary show, tales. Show them a picture of like a crackhead. Yeah. The mouth. Oh, mouth. oh, oh you yeah, got like, crack? Yeah. Do you this is what mouth? it looks like. <laughs> oh my God. I, you know, people have asked me before and it's like, uh, obviously I, I don't really think about that right now because that's so far ahead for me. So when I've been challenged with that question, I'm like, oh, you know, I don't, the way I answer is like, I just think I would be really honest. I think I'm, I'm. That's kind of who I am as it is as a person. I don't think I would be different with my son. I think you'd be good at it. And I think I would just yeah. be. And and I think I'd be wise enough to the point you made uh, about Jessica. Is I think I would be wise enough to allow them to steer the conversation versus me being a too much of a dad and trying to 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 teach and tell. Mm -hmm. You know, versus just let them ask me. Like mm -hmm. you know, let them ask the questions and then I respond honestly. Versus going right into like dad mode and being like this, 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 and this about everything and just kind of letting it naturally flow and then being myself and being honest. I think that would be, I think that would be the best way about it, but I, I'm yeah, not Yeah, it's hard either. not to impress your opinion on them because sure. what happens is, because I'm that's a, I have a tough time with that, because what will happen then is then they'll assume they know what I'm going to say and they might not bring it up versus, yeah, you know, my dad's pretty neutral and he kind of listens to me, so I'm going to tell him. Like, because- no matter what, your kid's gonna go through shit. Wouldn't you rather know and be a part of it mm -hmm. versus not? That's the that's the que the real question is that the question is not can I keep them from from getting to shit or being exposed to shit. The real question is do I want to be a part of it when they? Well, do? I think you said it best. That's perfect. I mean, the fact that if they're actually they have got the you know cojones to ask you about it already, that means they're definitely talking mm -hmm. about it with their friends. And they respect you enough as a dad that they're coming to you and, and at least inquiring. If And you have the opportunity, dad, to fuck that up or do it right. And you fucking it up would yeah. be blowing it off or saying, don't talk about it because they're going to go still talk about it. They're still going to go Google it. They're still going to be. And so if you have an opportunity to play a role in how they learn about that, I think that's very important Dude, well, that you're involved in that than to just be like, oh, I'm going to pretend like my kids don't talk about this stuff and just ignore it. Well, I think that's a way based worse on the questions my kids are asking. I, I think they're pretty comfortable because I, I look at I, I hear them and I'm like I can't believe if that came out of my mouth when I was your <laughs> I age. Know, my parents would have they would have locked me in my room forever. But you remember though that age? I mean, you for sure were talking about all that stuff. I remember that that was, at junior high going into high school. That's what it was. You wanted to be older so bad yep. that you were so interested in the adult conversation. You know what's yeah. interesting about that? How funny is this? What makes you get picked on or weird in junior high and high school is exactly what makes you cool and attractive when you get out. <laughs> Isn't so, that funny? How so? What do you well, mean? like, oh, you know, the, oh, oh you, you know, the guy who he's kind of, you know, beats, he goes to the beat of his own drum and he likes to uh, learn a lot or whatever. And then, you know, you get out of college. Like, dress that's is the, different. Yeah. That's the dude that everybody is attracted to, you know, or, yeah. you know, it's, it's just it, the person that tries to fit in so hard in high school and junior high that keeps you from getting picked on. But then when you, if you're a little bit, you know, if you got a little bit more charisma, a little different, kind of, you know, not so worried about being like everyone else becomes attractive later on. Maybe. You know? I, I think that kid still gets bullied in school too. I think the key to that more than anything is actually just being confident in who you are. The kid who's confident in who he is, uh, regardless of beating to his own drum, is right. the, is an attractive quality and what people tend to be drawn to because there's still that kid in, in high school who is awkward and weird and insecure and people still pick on him. So that the key is to, you know, be confident in who you are, no matter who that is, even if you're the, the nerdy kid who loves to well, read. Well, that's, that's what I mean, you know, because yeah. if you're that, that if you're, kid ends up being, well, that's what I mean. Cool. If, you're, if you're that way in high school, you're, you're, you're pretty confident because you're not trying to be like everybody, right? You're trying to do your own thing. Uh, it's kind of, you know, what yeah, I'm referring it's just to the authenticity of it all. Yeah. Dude, yeah. I, dude, uh, Arthur Brooks, uh, was just on a podcast and he did this quote that was so damn, that guy, man, is so good. So he said, he was explaining satisfaction and happiness. And I love what he said. He said, um, everybody tries to manage their satisfaction, uh, through their wants. Like, I want this, I want that, I want that. And he goes, no, no, no. The secret to satisfaction is not, uh, having more but rather wanting less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, manage your wants and bring them down 
And that'll give you satisfaction and happiness, not the other way around. So, so opposite. The Rolling Stones got it wrong. Yeah. They, it's exactly what he referred to. Uh, yeah. 100%. Oh, what is that? What was that? I, ain't got, I can't, uh, get, I can't get, no get no satisfaction. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. oh that's great. How interesting is that, yeah. right? Was that Rich Rolls? Was that the one he I think it was. Yeah, he had a good conversation with him. I listened did you to watch some, it? Uh, not all of it, but some of it I did. I mean, I do. I consume a lot of his content, too. He's so, he's so good. What a smart dude. Yeah. Uh, just a great person. I yeah. mean, when I think of, I mean, we've had the opportunity to meet a lot of amazing people brilliant minds um he's one of my favorite oh he's he's way up there Mm -hmm. for me yeah yeah 100 percent top 10 arguably top five maybe even top three as far as the people that i really really enjoy because he's just a genuine genuine dude and really intelligent really really intelligent and he's a he's one of those people that you want to add to your circle because you know he's going to bring so much value to your life because of his wisdom yeah. And and the and the message, the optimism, the positivity, yeah. Dude, he, everything else. He'll yeah. he'll text me fitness questions. I get so excited because I'm like, cool. I can now ask him a question about something. You know what I mean? Because I don't want to like yeah. message him all the time and bother him. Hey, can you help me with life? You know. <laughs> so he'll be like, Hey, Sal, what do you think about this? You know, exercise set thing or whatever. And I'll help him, and I'll be like, Cool. Now I get to ask you. Yeah. So, so yeah. I got something for you, Justin. Oh yeah. I, there was this page, of, um, and it was titled um, "Scientific Conspiracies That Turned Out to Be <laughs> True." Mm-hmm. So these are real conspiracies. Now, the first one you're probably familiar with, or one of the ones I'm going to mention, which is that the CIA really did experiment with mind control yeah. and psychedelics. Yeah. This is a real thing. It was called MK Ultra, yep. and they literally took LSD, and they took people, and they wanted to see if they could control them, control the personalities, get them to do what they want, brainwash them through the use of psychedelics. Do you know one of the experiments they did, which is... They admitted this is crazy. They went to a brothel. Uh, they went to a brothel. Yeah, the one in San Francisco. Yeah. Yes, they went to a brothel and they gave these. You know what do they call them? Johns. Johns. Yeah. They gave these Johns guys who showed up uh, LSD without telling them, and then tried to fuck with them. And the reason why they did that is they knew the Johns would never report it because they'd be like, uh, so "I was at then a brothel." They would, yeah, pin them back to where they were hanging out. <laughs> so one, so brilliant, bro. Yeah. One, <laughs> bro. So fucked up. But well, then they teach some of the the. Uh, ladies of the night. Um, <laughs> trying to be PC here. <laughs> yeah. Didn't they, didn't they teach them like manipulative uh, yes. techniques to, yeah, to, to mess with these jobs? Yes. Now check this out. The CIA director, Richard Helms, ordered the destruction of all records relating to MK Ultra in 1973. So that means that the evidence we have today is like just a little bit. All the other records were destroyed. This is all confirmed. Yep. And we know that the research was responsible for at least one hospitalization and two deaths. Wow. So people there committed a, suicide. Dude, there's, well, there's a book out, I believe it's called Chaos, I think, that like uh, ties um, Charles Manson to uh, this, the MK Ultra experiments. Yes. And that when he was in, he was doing it, wasn't he? He was in prison, like, I guess uh, he got visited and, uh, uh, Taught how to manipulate people and, through LSD, and and you everybody. I mean, not everybody. You know about the the murders that some of his followers, like these were middle class kids who went and murdered a bunch of people. One of them was pregnant, like crazy yeah. stuff. And these were like normal, well adjusted kids. And part of the strategy that he had was he would give them LSD and then do this whole like. Well, wasn't it because too like that we got into that whole like mind control thing because of uh, I don't know if it was it, what country it was, but where else we saw that if it was China or Russia or uh, another country that had already got ahead of us on that in terms of like them experimenting with their population and, and really like digging into well, mind control. Well, so a lot of people don't realize this, but during the Cold War, and so I have a little bit of empathy for- Yeah, I think it was Russia. I have a little bit of empathy for the US government during this period of time because you had the Cold War and we literally had just developed weapons that could destroy the whole world. Okay, so we have a CIA whose so job- nothing's off the table when you think exactly. About it. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah, we got to figure some shit out. There's, yeah, there's nukes that could end us, so like we got to find find a competitive edge. They assess yeah. a threat, then they have to yeah, basically like yeah. be able to neutralize or create I agree our own. Exactly, like the Soviets have all these nukes pointed at us. We have nukes pointed at them. At any moment, we could destroy the whole world. So we're scrambling. Everything's for, off the we're, table. Yeah, we're scrambling for anything, any edge that we can get. Totally. And yep. so that's and now the problem is we we created this org or this agency, this organization. And they get funded off the times, off the books. We've got proof of that. The Iran-Contra scandal proved that, where we were, were smuggling drugs in to raise money for them or whatever. So, they, and But it doesn't go away, right? Cold War ends. They don't end this agency. There's always a threat. So then it kind of gets out of hand. But anyway, here's another one. 
Did you know that water can affect the sex of frogs? Remember when what's his name said that? <laughs> Alex, <laughs> Alex Jones. Jones was talking about gay frogs. Bro, this is true. So there was a 2010 paper from the University of Berkeley that found that one in 10 male frogs exposed to atrazine, which is a common pesticide, experienced a hormonal imbalance that effectively turned them female. What? So one out of 10 of these frogs, instead of becoming male, became female because they were exposed to this very common pesticide. That's a real thing. So you said 1973 wow. on the first one, MK Ultra, right? Yeah. Isn't that the same year that the word conspiracy theory was was developed by the Ooh, CIA? I believe so. I was actually just reading this the other day because I was some, I was talking with somebody and they were saying that somebody was calling Good job, them, Adam. Somebody was calling yeah. them a conspiracy theorist, and I was just like, such you, a you, pejorative now, right? Yeah, I'm like, do you even know that, that was that was an in, invented you know term to that mess was, with people? Yes, yeah. to throw them off of like the, the the trail and stuff like that. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, and I'm I and I was like, I better do my own homework because I'm saying this, and I'm pretty sure when I pulled it up, I believe it was 1973 when the CIA created that that term that was never put to get the conspiracy and theory was never put together as a term and to make you feel like and that's try, what they would immediately try to discount discredit you by making you look like some wild yeah. crazy person yeah there. well okay so here's one that which i asked. always find really interesting because it gets thrown around so much is like look, especially these days look yeah. by, the, by the by by now uh you should also you should realize that this shit's weird because yeah. I don't know how many conspiracy theories are now turned out to be. Yeah, most conspiracy all of them. theories now are just people that pay attention. Uh, <laughs> Oftentimes, that's, I, that's where I'm yeah. at. Did you guys know Area 51? So that was counter psyops. So Area 51, the whole like, oh my god, there's aliens at Roswell. Ah, the CIA actually made that story and planted it so it would throw people off the trail of the fact that they were developing the Blackbird, mm -hmm. the fastest plane ever invented in history was at Area 51. And they wanted to make sure nobody knew. So they created this whole thing about aliens and they put it out in the media. People started buying on onto it. So, well, it, so instead of saying, oh my God, there's a secret lab where they're creating these planes, everybody's like, there's aliens there. Because of that, it's like, that's where my thought process always goes. If we start seeing phenomena or we start yeah. seeing, um, you know, uh, physics and, and abilities of craft and things in the, in the sky, it's like, well, like, we don't we don't know what kind of advancements we've made technologically like behind the scenes of everything and it's like we've have we have supersonic drones we have um you know who who knows what kind of technology that's that's already there that just the public isn't aware well of. wasn't it like when was this the stealth bomber that was supposed to like fly in the 70s i think they started it was even, the i thought it was even earlier than that we didn't find out till like like 20 30 years later we didn't so. unveil that till uh up you yeah, know when freedom we freedom information act no is, no no it's when we when we invaded iraq when iraq oh, went that, to kuwait yeah. in the during the first gulf war and then we showed everybody, look, we got these planes that you can't pick up on radar. Yeah. That shit was, we had that stuff for decades. Yeah, yeah, for decades. So to think, I mean, you know what's so funny? I was, I told you guys I was listening to um, the Andrew Schultz and Logan Paul uh, conversation uh, just the other day. And I actually have never heard anybody else say this until uh, until now, because you say it all the time, of your theory on all the UFOs or UABs or whatever they call them now, um, that it's not really like, extraterrestrial life no. it's most likely us flexing yeah on other that's what I he think. said the exact same thing mm -hmm. i never heard anyone else say before. because you can't tell everybody well, look at this technology we have right but you know okay so what do you think china and russia are thinking when we're showing these videos we're like oh my god it changes directions instantly it goes underwater <laughs> yeah. they're scrambling like yeah like let's you, make this happen you know like, they're thinking yelling like, at the engineers yes they're thinking like oh they they own this crap? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. We better not. I mean, it makes Especially sense. Especially right now when well, we're showing more of it. Well, yeah, exactly. If we're letting, if they're letting it out, you know, and they're and then in addition to that, it's like they only fly over the U.S. Yeah. Know, <laughs> conveniently. You know what I'm saying? Just more yeah. shooting us. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, rest hey, of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, everybody, yeah. we'd like to let you know we're investigating this because nothing we could do would ever fight one of these. We couldn't shoot it down. We couldn't stop it. It could literally fly it's over your country hopeless. and blow you up and you wouldn't even know it. Radars can't pick so it up. So wild. Like, you guys are fucked. All right, so here's the last one. This one was pretty crazy. You know, during the, the during the, uh, the the years where we banned alcohol, so this was uh, prohibition, it was a big deal. Government's like, no, alcohol is illegal. Huge black market. A, a, a lot of people don't know this, but the U.S. government actually, in order to fight the war on alcohol, purposely put poison oh, wow. in illegal, in black market alcohol. They actually put poison in it 
and they probably killed about around 10,000 people. Wow. What? Through this process. I didn't know. Evil I've never heard, I've never heard of that one. Yes, they, they put they would put uh benzene, mercury, or methanol. So you wouldn't really taste it. Um and they think around 10,000 people died Damn. as a result of this. So they thought, "Hey, we're going to get we're going to stop People from drinking alcohol, let's just poison the supply. Is that when that was going on, Doug? Dude, how yeah, 1920 up is that? to 1933. That's what you're, well, prohibition? Yeah. Yeah. And that was a, that was wow, a huge. Wow, dude. Yeah. Right now, the war on drugs, I think drugs is one, yeah. by the way. More <laughs> government <laughs> regulation. Yeah. Hey, speaking of alcohol, so I had a phone call with Zach, the founder of Zbotics. I have been misrepresenting Zbotics and how it works. Oh, way to go. Uh -oh. Okay. We have yeah. a lawsuit coming or something? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I want to, I know. <laughs> no, I want to be very accurate. Okay. So here's what happens it's not that you, so when you drink alcohol, some of the alcohol gets metabolized and there's a byproduct called acetaldehyde, and that's what wreak, wreaks havoc in the body. Okay. What I was saying was that your liver can't keep up with the processing, so acetaldehyde gets in your system, whatever. That's not what's happening. The liver does a phenomenal job of breaking down uh, acetaldehyde and processing. What happens is when you drink alcohol, some of the alcohol gets metabolized in the gut. Then the acetaldehyde gets released in the gut and put in the bloodstream. Uh. That's when it wrecks havoc in the body. But then once it's in the bloodstream, eventually the liver then processes it and cleans it out. So the way Zbiotics works is it's bacteria that's genetically modified to produce compounds that break down acetaldehyde. So, so basically you, you digest it, it goes in the gut, and but, it goes but the in- But the breaks it down. Break, yeah. So it doesn't get in the bloodstream uh, and cause you know lots of issues for people. Uh, so I that's see. how, it's not because the liver's overwhelmed. It's so, it's the, the gut part. So mm -hmm. that's, this bacteria goes in the gut, breaks down the acetaldehyde, and then you don't get this acetaldehyde like you would normally in your blood, which causes now, all of those issues. Okay, now, now that you have an even better understanding of it, because something that I've wondered before, and, I, and I've- tested and in my experience it still kind of works uh ideally you're supposed to take it before you start drinking yeah, yeah. but i've started like i've had a drink and then i forgot like oh shit i i haven't taken it and then i go take it and it seems to still, still work makes a difference yeah, it I does the same thing yeah so obviously the longer you wait the less of a difference it's going to make i yeah. think it's because it's still happening in the gut that may be why you know and you think that part of what uh, what i was thinking was part of the hangover process for me like if i had one drink doesn't give me so much of all the, the the negative side effects it's like if i keep drinking so the fact that i got it in there it, and i and then i continue to drink going forward yeah. maybe it's still well, ne neutralize some of it or right some yeah. of the well we have to be very careful with how we present it because yeah. um I, I know that you can't say hangover cure you can't you can't use those words because they're medical conditions so it's it's uh, highly regulated hangover is a medical condition yeah yeah you can't really? yeah, i didn't know that either yeah you can't say that something d treats that or does anything to that but the acetaldehyde that gets in the blood it does wreak havoc in the body so it does cause for a lot of people to not feel so good. And so that again, breaking it down in the gut before it can get to the bloodstream, yeah. that's kind of, that's that's what it does. And that's I wanna, why I notice a big difference. Like if I do it, I just I feel I feel a lot better. Yeah. I want to know how many people have been to the hospital like, I got a hangover, doc, help me out. Yeah. I know. You're not a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't uh, yeah. uh, diagnose yourself with yeah. that, yeah. sir. Isn't that funny? Yeah. What what oh. things are what things are regulated and like, what so, things so, aren't? Yeah. So dumb. Isn't that dude. funny? It is so dumb, isn't it dumb? Uh, yeah. I feel like it's dumb. Ma, you protected so many people, guys. Thanks for that regulation. Yeah. And I feel like California is the worst result worst with all that stuff, right? I mean, I feel like we Well, have you know so what makes me laugh is you buy a product, okay? Uh you buy a mattress or a shirt or whatever. And the freaking label on it's this long. Like you buy a hair dryer, okay? The warning label is this long. It's now because so many regulations tell you they have to warn you about every damn thing that you don't read anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's gonna read that? It's gonna take me an hour and a half to read this, and it's all written in jargon that it, you know I have to kind of decipher it because of the so it's funny that it, that the regulations actually make you not read right. some <laughs> yeah. of the risks as all a result right. of I agree. all that. Yep. Hey, check this out. Uh, sodas are not very good for you. However. There is one that is. It's called Olipop. It's not a soda, but it sure damn tastes like it. In fact, it's low calorie. It's like 30 calories a can, low sugar, high in fiber. No joke. This is a drink that's high in fiber and gut healthy uh, ingredients. So this is a gut health soda drink, okay? And the flavors are incredible. Root beer, vintage cola, strawberry vanilla, orange squeeze, cherry vanilla, ginger lemon. There's grape, uh, tropical punch. Tastes amazing. You got to get their variety pack. Try them all. See what you think. Go check them out. Go to drinkolipop.com. That's drink, O-L-I-P-O-P.com forward slash mind pump. Then use the code mind pump and get 20% off plus free shipping on your order. 
All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Brian from Pennsylvania. Brian, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, how you guys doing today? Good, good. good. good man. Good. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm looking for advice on a topic that's related to uh, when you guys talk about the lifting program that Justin developed for his football team. Oh, all right. Okay. So just to kind of give you some background, I'm a high school baseball coach. Our season ended about two weeks ago. And then this is the second season that they've asked me to develop the off-season lifting program for the team. Um, last year, I was able to come up with a plan. We had about two months uh, for the uh, players to come in and lift. They came in about two times a week for about two hours. Uh, so I really focused on total body workouts. One of the workouts was focused primarily with barbell, and the other one was focused primarily with dumbbells. And they were both total body workouts. And every few weeks, I tried to progress the reps, like five to eight range, and then a couple of weeks would go by eight to 12, and then 12 to 15. This year is a little bit different. Um, we're looking at uh, developing the lower body strength of our uh, players as well as our core strength. Uh, we have a lot of younger guys on the team this year. Um, they're about maybe 100 to 150 pounds, and that's being a little generous on that end. Um, and, and we're just trying to get as much as we can out of these guys. We're going to try to do it for three months this year and, and maybe bump it up to three times a week. Um, so I'm just looking for advice on how to possibly program um, this uh, – you know, these lifting sessions for these athletes to get the most out of the time that they're there. What, if you don't mind me asking, what, um, what do you would say is like their biggest weakness right now in terms of like what you notice in their uh, abilities in uh, their, were they prone to injury? Like, or, or what, what was the season like and where are they at in terms of like what type of athletes they are? Right. So last year we had an older team. Um, a lot of the guys kind of knew their way around the weight room. Um, there was a little bit of teaching of some like of the form and mechanics. And I have a little background in training, so I was able to help with that. Those guys have since graduated. There was no injury problems that we had. Um, but the guys that we have now are on the smaller side. They're, they're young, a lot of freshmen, a lot of sophomores uh, looking to get more overall power, like, you know, pop off the bat, uh, arm strength. Um, and like I said, some explosiveness from the legs and also from the core, you know, with a lot of the swing mechanics comes from those areas of the body. So uh, they're just, they're younger guys and they're not very big and they're not very heavy. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at moving into uh, next season. Yeah, no, I just asked because I didn't know if like you needed to spend a lot of time with um, just figuring out <clears throat> how to get them to move better in general and, and be able to organize their body appropriately. Uh, if, if really, if it's strength and if it's power that you're going with, um, I see, I see our mass performance program as being a perfect, uh, sort of a complimentary, uh, program for this, especially if you're going to move towards like a three day a week, you know, foundational lifts. And then are you doing like skills training in between or, uh, anything like that? So we're going to do some skills training here towards the end of the summer, but when we hit the fall, we're going to be focused primarily on, on the weight room. Um, I think there would be some uh, benefit in doing some like a, the mobility type things and some, especially like the flexibility for like shoulders, you know, like I said, with throwing, um, that's an important part, you know, uh, but when it hits the fall, we're going to be looking primarily at doing um, lifting and not so much you know, uh, fundamentals of baseball that'll pick up in the winter as we lead into the spring. Yeah. I like, I mean, I like all those ideas. I, I definitely like building that base of strength, uh, first. So that's like something like, and I know you switched up kind of the rep scheme, like every two weeks or so, like in our programs, we tend to stick around at least three to four weeks, um, and really establish a good mechanics with that and also get them familiar with that so they can build strength. Uh, and then start to shift the focus on, you know, hypertrophy and then more of like functional training. So I try to kind of time it all up. So that way, um, a lot of the, uh, the functional training and then the, um, the conditioning kind of leads back into the season. Um, so in, in sort of, and mass performance is kind of a microcosm of that. So depending on how long, you know, you're structuring this, um, I added, I added a bit of our maps anabolic kind of program concepts, uh, with my kids when we were training for football specifically, because there was a big lack of strength and just okay. that base of strength was non-existent. So, 
Um, you know, I spent, you know, uh, quite a bit of extra time on those compound lifts and really like reiterating like the, the, the top five to seven, you know, compound lifts that will really get them a good base of strength. And then now we've shifted into more of our <clears throat> multi-planar type of exercises and I'm really incorporating more functional work. Uh, obviously with baseball players, like rotational work is a huge component to that. So if you can, if you can make sure you program that, obviously, uh, you know, in more of the functional training side of it, uh, you know, this is where I like to, especially with baseball players, I don't know how familiar you are with like Indian clubs or anything. I've always wanted to experiment, uh, you know, incorporating that into that, um, that, that type of an athlete, just because it's so valuable in terms of, uh, you know, really bulletproofing the shoulder and getting that uh, loaded uh, rotation uh, movement throughout uh, their shoulders and, and to really try to kind of, uh, you know, build that strength support and that stability around the shoulders. Because that's, I mean, between shoulders, between, you know, hips and, and, and knees and ankles and everything else, um, if you just make sure you're, you're considering all that in your programming with priming them ahead of time. Obviously, like I, I took some of the, the compass tests, so it's really basic to do uh, before we even start any of our workouts. And we just had them doing wall presses. I had them doing like shoulder circles, which is a good one, kneeling circles, uh, especially with baseball players would be great. Um, and then, um, you know, <clears throat> timing it. So I, I would shift probably, um, well, back to the priming. So then, uh, basically that in our squats, uh, that we would do with our, our stick and then also our, um, uh, windmill test with that too. So those are like the three, the main ones that I would have them working on. So that way we get, uh, we hit all the points, um, appropriately in terms of like, you know, getting everything warm, warmed up, activated and everything for the workouts. Brian, did you happen to listen to the episode that Joe DeFranco interviewed Justin just recently? I, I'm not sure. I listen to a lot of them, but I, I can't remember that one in particular. So it's not on our platform. It's actually Joe, okay. DeFran Joe DeFranco. And if I, if you're not familiar yeah, with no. Joe DeFranco, you okay. absolutely should dive into his stuff because m much of the stuff that we've, yeah. we've built on related to sports performance comes from Joe DeFranco. So he's like one of the OGs in the space. Okay. Uh, he just recently did a great interview of Justin and they basically talked all about his experience coaching young mm -hmm. athletes at the high school level. And they both were just going back and forth with all their years of experience and sharing some of the challenges with groups, with guys being stronger, weaker, and some of the things that they've implemented, everything from challenges to what exercises they would eliminate, what exercises Risk they first reward, like yeah. yeah, all those things. Yeah. And I did went in a lot more detail there. I think it's like it's a fire hose right now. Like if I was to like shoot off the exact program I'd write for you, I'd have to sit down for a while and really kind of draw it up. But um, I, I think that that's a great episode to listen yeah, to. Yeah, one of the sure. challenges with with young athletes like that is uh, you have some exercises that are very valuable, but there's a long period of time where you have to learn how to do the exercise properly before you can really derive lots of benefit. So some exercises that you can do now that a lot of your athletes might be able to within a week or two perform properly. Like rather than doing like, for example, a traditional deadlift, you can use a trap bar, much, much lower skill, still lots of carryover, um, sled work. Most people can push a sled, a heavy sled. Doesn't require as much skill as like a barbell squat, split stance exercises, like walk, walking lunges, less skill than let's say a barbell squat, for example. So those might, you know, those may be the exercises you focus on just because you only have a few months mm -hmm. and it may take right. two months just to get your freshman to be able to perform a barbell squat properly, and you have three weeks left to build strength on it. Whereas you could be doing like walking lunges or uh, sled, and you could start to progress them with strength, you know, after the first week or so. So I, I love uh, I love landmine stuff too. I don't know if you guys have access to a landmine or not, but for baseball players, the rotational strength, anti-rotation benefits that you get uh, from a landmine, and and it's pretty easy to to teach uh, in comparison to some like a, a snatch or a power clean yeah. or something like that. So And, and uh, you know, three days a week is great. Here's the other side of it, though, by the way. You, you mentioned how small the guys were and you want to increase, increase strength. They got to eat more. Yeah. You got to really focus on getting them to eat more. And uh, with kids, it can be really tough. One of my – I've always had a lot of success with uh, helping them make shakes. Mm -hmm. So, like, here's a protein powder – uh, put it with some whole milk, add some peanut butter and some strawberries, and I want you all to drink this twice a day, you know, or something like that, right? That really, really helps with the calories. But don't eat less. Just add these shakes on top of, you know, what you're currently doing. That could help. Um, Magic Spoon Cereal, okay? It's a company we work with. Kids 
Love that. J- Justin for a while there was using them yeah. as giveaways uh, when they when the kids would do something you know great. He would use a bottle, and they would all clamor for it. And it's okay. Why they all like cereal? But it's a high protein cereal, so it gives them you know whey protein and yeah, you know, good advice. I don't know any teenage boys that doesn't, don't like to eat cereal th- you know three times a day, right? So um, I would I would be shakes and foods like that, and I'd say because you're dealing with a hundred pound kid. They're going to build strength. Like you want to, I mean, look, and I tell you what, at that age, you know, in a three month period, you could add 10 pounds of good muscle in a three, in a three month period, but it's got to come, it's got to come from calories. It's got to come from calories and strength training. If they don't eat that food, they'll get stronger, but the muscle's not going to come on. That's, so. such, that's such an excellent point. Getting good yeah. at a couple good core lifts and making sure they're eating properly, putting on, I mean, that, that that's the majority of what, yeah, you're going to receive in terms of like their progress. Yeah. And that's. That's really been what we've been trying to work on the most is just mastering um, the the ones that move the needle the most. And so those five to seven core lifts, um, getting them really proficient in that, um, focusing on eating and then recovery. And so in between in the days, we do skills, but also we do more mobil- mo- mobility focused type days. And this is also why I mentioned like mass reforms because we structured that in there. Uh, so it does hit all those all those joints nicely and it also gets that um, multiplanar movement started so that way you know they're able to um, react and respond and have that kind of uh, stability uh, that's going to help them even perform better on top of this new strength and this new weight that they're hopefully going to gain some weight out of this as well yeah but you know you can literally write up like a a, a recipe you know a muscle a mass gaining recipe shake recipe you have a vegan option a non-vegan option hand them to the kids all right guys over the next three months i want all of you to have two of these a day on top of your meals and you're going to pack on some muscle. It's got to be very simple when you're dealing. Is with that a popular thing? Kids. Vegan pop, vegan baseball high school players. <laughs> you know what? I, we're, it's 2022. Tell, <laughs> tell me you tell me you don't have a bunch it's of vegan tw- baseball players. It's do you? 2022. <laughs> like I, I'm just trying to cover all the bases here. You know what I mean? No pun intended. So. We're lucky if they don't show up beating Wendy's or something like uh, that. Yeah. So, you know. Exactly. Yeah. But you never know. You got some kid. Oh, I can't have milk. You know? All right, that's fine. So, but yeah, you give them you give them a recipe here. Have this twice a day, guys. This is part of your you know this is your deal, and then stay on top of it. Do you have your shakes? And then, you know, like, you know, four exercises, three days a week, you got it covered. Low skill ones though. I, I want to stress that because right. when I've okay. trained 14, 15, 16 year olds, it's like, you know, and if I had them for a long time, I would spend uh, a J- long time they, teaching them Just, squats. Justin and Joe cover that in the episode really well. In fact, we haven't even touched on it. They, something that they, they did a lot of that you should incorporate is isometrics. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, okay. when, especially when you're training in a group setting, right? You got 10, 15, 20 guys at mm-hmm. once. You know, uh, yeah. Joe and him were talking about how, like, Joe DeFranco claims that his favorite exercise is like a static lunge, mm-hmm. just putting them all in a lunge position. And then that way it allows you as a coach to walk around and adju- right. address posture, address knee, address, yeah. like, and, it, and just, and then he says you get a lot of great strength carryover just from isometric holds with their body weight. And so, um, yeah, they talk a little, make sure you listen to that episode. Yeah. I think it's a very valuable episode on the, the things, the pitfalls that they talk about. And I mean, I learned a lot listening and I've been hanging out with Justin for almost 15 years and still learn something from that episode. Yeah. We went in a lot better depth there. Yeah. This yeah. is kind of like a snippet. So. Yeah. If you don't have mass performance, we'll send that to you. Okay, Brian. Okay, great. And you said something about the priming movements before the work. And I think that's really important because their warm ups are not the best. Yeah. So I think that would help. I, I didn't know if there was like anything uh, specific that, you know, I could just, like you said, just a few of them to get like, you know, them used to doing it, mm-hmm. not overloading them with too much information, but just yeah. a few key I, ones to hit on. I think those, um, and, and you could do this right away by just going on our, uh, the, the free webinars that okay. Adam and I both did, but uh, the one specifically that I did, um, is our compass test. And so they're very basic. So it's just right. You can, you can do this with the whole team and have them up against a wall and they do okay. the wall press first and you can kind of walk around and see, uh, where everybody's at in terms of like yeah. their ability. Can, can they touch their elbows all the way to the wall while also, you know, drawing in their stomach and not having this crazy rib flare. Um, you can look at all these things that are happening in terms of, uh, imbalances and, and dysfunction. So, um, that's a good one to do with the whole team. And then, uh, the, the windmill and then also the squat test as well. Like I'll do the squat test and I'll have them sit down in that squat and just see where I'm at. Like, cause a lot of kids will, you know, raise their, their, their heels, like their bodies, like they can't even maintain that position. And, you know, it, it also allows you by like what Adam was saying in terms of the isometric part of it, like I just slow things down the cadence a lot uh, in the beginning so I can walk around and I can kind of like just little cues and, and just uh, some, some physical feedback to kind of show them where they should be 
Uh, and then also when they keep practicing this before the workouts, they get better at it and it, it just puts them in better posture and it gets their muscles firing a bit, a bit more effectively that way. Yeah. So it's maps, primewebinar.com. Okay. And you'll learn that there. Excellent. Thank right, you. Man. Thanks for calling cool. in. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks a lot. I appreciate all your help. Thank you. Yeah. Good you luck, man. man. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to emphasize the the calories thing because I don't know you you work with like teenage kids. No, it's such Boys, a it's they such, just skip it's such, breakfast. No, they, it's such a great yeah. point because they could be they could be doing all of these lifts trying to el build some muscle and strength, but if they're under eating calories, under eating protein, <laughs> you're going to get very little from it. Maybe, maybe yep. they'll adapt to the skill set of the exercise, but they're not going to build good muscle strength no. and power from that. So it's such a good. There point. was a program that was going around online that. All these kids, these teenage boys were like, oh my God, this works so well. It was called Go Mad. Have you guys heard of this? Go Mad. Gallon of milk a day. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why they gained so much size doing that. It was because it literally told people drink a gallon of whole milk yeah. every single day. You take a bunch of kids like this and you just you throw some calories at them and have them lift. As long as they don't hurt themselves, yeah. it's like prime. They're prime to build muscle. Our next caller is Vadim from New York. Vadim, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Um, hello. Um, I had a question um, regarding, uh, I was recently running low on time and uh, I've, I've read this idea of trying to run like a full body routine just when you're low on time with just a low bar squat, incline bench press and a uh, supinated uh, bent over barbell row for like when you're short on time. I'm just wondering if that's even a good idea. Um, long, uh, do, do you want me to stop, like leave it as a short term question or just give you the long term well the the, I, the 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 short the short answer yeah. to that is that's awesome yeah, that's, a, that's a that's a great great if i have 15 minutes those are great great choice that's yeah. a great choice so oh. I, so there's that answer yeah I, I yeah i tried something like this before and i also tried doing like the power lifting three moves but i noticed with the power lifting is that my back what after some time my back gets so trashed that I'm like, um, I need some changes here, you know? Yeah. That's where I kind of tried the bent over row. And I had good results after, like, my deadlift went up before. And the only thing that I've seen that, like, when I'm low on time, that kind of didn't really go up with it was the dip, the low, basically the lower chest with the incline. I guess it, the, it hits the shoulders quite a bit on the upper pec. Uh, a lot, but I guess the lower pec doesn't get hit as hard. But I'm like, the bench press still went up. So I'm like, technically speaking, this should be okay for when you're sh well, short on time. Yeah, no. Uh, that's kind of the question. Yeah, no, there's but, nothing wrong with it. Uh, those are three. It's a three uh, exercise combination. That's great. Another one would be like squats, dips, and pull-ups would be another one. I mean, you basically pick, you know, three movements that cover everything. Your back probably got trashed before because you squatted and deadlifted in the same workout. Um, and, and that's usually not a good idea for most people. It's just a lot on the lower back for most people. So I don't typically like to squat and deadlift in the same workout. If I squat, I don't deadlift. If I deadlift, I don't squat. So what you might want to do next time is instead of squatting, do a deadlift and then do two other exercises. You know, you could do something like that, but a lower yeah. body, a pushing like, and a pulling movement is a great, a great, simple, short workout. Um, what would you recommend in terms of supplementing? Like today, I actually, I seem to have some more time. I'm planning to deadlift and uh, dip in a chin up, uh, maybe throw some lat raises or what would you like overhead to, press. if you're going to be running this short term, yeah. like, what would you want to throw into o it? Overhead press. Overhead press. Some kind of overhead, overhead press. press. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then if you have even more time, um, and, uh, I would, what would, go ahead. Go ahead. I was no, going to yeah, I I say, and if you have even more time, I would throw in a core exercise, maybe like a plank or something at the end. Okay. Um, in terms of, I am planning to try to run the powerlifting program that you guys have and the strongman, both of them. I just, I, I kind of have a to-do list to try to sometime try to actually powerlift and see where, where I get the numbers in. What would you recommend in terms of to getting better numbers in the powerlift? Should I try to do the strongman first, run that program and then finalize in the powerlift or do the alternative? If it's very, if it's very specific to the powerlifting mm -hmm. lifts, powerlift power is going to do the best. Specifically. If the goal is general overall muscle and strength, then I would go power lift and strong or strong and power lift. It really doesn't make a big difference. But if it's, it's if, you're, if your main goal is the power lifting lifts, 
Maps Powerlift. Is, I mean, that's what that program was designed for. Yeah, I, I have both of the programs. I was just thinking, it was like I could. I know I'm gonna have a time where I'm gonna have more time, and I want to devote to one and both of them basically because I love both of them. The idea, and I was wondering, should I try to do the powerlifting first to kind of get the core really strong, and then do the powerlifting program and then go into a meet, or does the powerlift the strongman program won't really affect much, uh, like oh, in terms of boosting the powerlift? I see. Okay, if you have a meet. Then you want to do power lift up to, uh, up to the meat. Yeah, it's designed yeah. to peak you. Yeah, so so if you're let's the more say practice with it, the better. Yeah, so let's say six months from now you have a meat science set up. Then I would go strong, and then I would end in power lift. Mm. Basically, you want to end power lift before the meat because that's going to give you the most strength specific uh, and, skill. With and that. if you have plenty of time, and you and we we're not on a time, there's nothing wrong with going power lift strong, and then sign up for a power lift meet, and then follow power lift into the meat. Right. You get great results from but that. But do you think? Uh, so basically, do, uh, run run as much. But do you think that there'll be any carryover from the strongman yeah, uh, yeah. training? I'm, yeah, to, yeah absolutely. Should, yeah, there'll be carryover. But what what Sal's saying is, when you said a meet, the power okay. lift is literally designed to peak you at a meet. So if to I was, peak you at, yeah, yeah. So if you had it, like if you gave me a date on your meet, we would take power lift and back it out. I think it's a how many weeks is the program total? Is it for power lift? Yeah, is it ten, eleven? No, I think it was either twelve or fourteen. Or was it that long? Six, okay, yeah. so it's like so. However many Spring. weeks power lift is, I would literally that we would follow that leading up to that. And now, if you had more time than that, then we could do like strong before because there are some carryovers <laughs> that you'll get from strong that is going to help you with power lift, and then go into power lift before your meet. Um, what about in terms of, uh, like if I'm running right now at these three exercises, since I'm low on time, you know, do, uh, like, I know that I try to do, still do like 90, 90 to make sure my hips are decently. Do you, do you recommend me trying to go through some drills like mobility just to make sure if I'm going to go back to back with these, uh, should I try to, uh, run, try to get like maps prime, yeah. uh, not pr maps performance in the middle of it? Or do you think? think the strongman will hit multiple of the angles enough that oh. my joint should still be decent if I, I mean, run I mean you know, the good part about yeah the good part about prime is that you learn kind of where you need to focus the most and so that's where you kind of develop uh your routine before every workout uh -huh. so that's so that's always gonna be beneficial for okay. you to carry into any of those programs so because i have prime pro so basically try to find where my weak points and tries to still do them right now to just to keep that mobility Correct. as much as yeah. possible Correct. And, and it works with okay. any program and also keep in mind that when you you do you, it doesn't always have to be during your, your your you know you have 15 minutes you say maybe sometimes to lift you can you can do those yeah. priming exercises and those mobility drills that are from that you know at home uh, in front of the tv in your bedroom like you know those are those are things that you're you're working on getting a better connection and working on like overall posture or joint health, it doesn't hurt to do that multiple times a day. Whenever you have free time, it doesn't. Now, ideally, of course, you would like to do that to prime and set up before you go into a workout every time you work out. But it doesn't mean you can't do it in addition to that outside of that, too. That makes sense. All right. Thanks for calling okay. in. Vadim. So, yeah, by the way, uh, I just want to thank you for taking the call. And you guys are doing an amazing job. Uh, I love how you guys uh give advice that's actually applicational to the everyday person because i look at the training like okay like uh i can't do a full-on bodybuilding program all the time it's like i just don't got time for that but like the practical examples you guys do is just amazing i, I love it oh i appreciate awesome. it thank you very much thanks, man. man thanks for calling in yep have a great day yeah when it, uh, a lot of people don't well, know this is i know we've talked about this before but it's important to reiterate that if you have a specific strength goal in other words i want to get strong at this specific movement, um, a lot of strength has to do with the skill of right, that movement. Right. So if I want to get good at squats, well, you got to squat, right? Mm -hmm. And now you could do lots of exercises that'll strengthen your quads, your hamstrings, your glutes, your core, all which are involved in a squat. But because strength, is, so much of strength is a skill, practicing that specific movement is going to give you the greatest carryover. So, you know, you asked about the powerlifting. Yeah, strong is going to have some carryover and it's good because the movements are different. So it'll avoid any pitfalls or injuries or whatever. But powerlift is specifically for powerlifting. Nothing's going to make you stronger at those yeah. powerlifting lifts than yeah, powerlifting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know? yeah, developing that skill takes a lot of practice. So, you know, you want to get to it as much as possible. I think he just, I think it's set, what I got from it was I, one day, you know, one day, no time frame. One day, I want to do a powerlifting meet. I want to get good at these yeah, core recreationally. Lifts. Yeah, what should I do? And will using strong assist or help me towards that overall goal? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you got 
nine months, a year, two years from right. now down the road, then uh, I absolutely would interrupt my, you know, uh, you know um, maps power lift with strong. I think that would complement it really well to if you're, you know, got a year of time. But if you got 12 weeks and you're thinking about doing a power lift meet, <laughs> then nothing's going to be better than doing That's maps right. power lift. Our next caller is Michael from Colorado, originally from Canada. What's up, Michael? How can we help you? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, man. How you Good. doing? Good. Good. Hey, just first off, just want to thank you guys for all the all the work you do since I discovered your podcast. Uh, made some crazy gains and uh, just loving it. Loving the, the banter back and forth as well. So awesome. I'm going to give you guys just a little background. I've been lifting regularly for 20 plus years, but you know, for most of those years, I was probably, uh, playing competitive squash and running a lot. So I was leaning in shape, but uh, probably lacking a lot of muscle. Um, since discovering your podcast, uh, which coincided with COVID, um, wasn't able to play squash, um, started going to just the basement and working out and hitting the weights a bit more. Uh, long story short, packed on a lot of muscle, uh, fell in love with the deadlift, and just want to take it to the next level. So uh, I've completed anabolic. Uh, I've completed strong. I am heading into phase three of aesthetic and kind of wanting to focus more on the bar and less on the scale and just wondering what your thoughts are on cleans uh, as a way of a um, helping out my deadlift and b um, you know subbing it in for shrugs because you, know, you, you guys seem to love shrugs as a trap development and I'm getting a little <laughs> tired of it and just wondering if you guys can uh, so, maybe give me an alternative yeah. to uh, get the traps going <laughs> well, without you know, always having to shrug. You know, like it's sad, like Sal, dude. It's, shrugs, it's shrugs are a, they're a low skill uh, way of strengthening the shoulder girdle, uh, but cleans are. And it cleans are an amazing exercise. It's like one of my favorite exercises. The only problem is it's a very high skill exercise. It's a speed uh, type movement. So like um, hang you know, cleans, hang cleans that would be awesome for yeah, for trap development. That's yeah, and I, I and I, you got to practice with really lightweight and perfect the technique and the skill of it because your tendency maybe most people when they try and do a hang clean the first few times they're used to lifting weights and so it looks like a reverse curl or like a like they're doing a lift. It's a it's a it's a very you know coordinated kind of fast movement, and I would start with the bar or lighter, and just perfect the skill. And don't go to fatigue; just perfect the skill of it. And as you get better with it, then you can add weight. But I mean, for upper back development, it's got to be one of the best exercises that, that's known to me. It's just a high skill one. That's why I don't necessarily recommend it unless somebody has the the patience and the time to learn it. The the one thing I would ask you because you, you you look like you're about our age or close to. Um, and you sounds like you skipped performance, which is it, a lot of people do. How's your mobility joints? How do you feel like that would be my only concern is making sure you're addressing that stuff. So because I played squash and played hockey all growing up, uh, I do have pretty good mobility. Um, cool. I still play tennis and I, I find that like I still, I have performance. I got the RGB bundle oh, okay. and, um, I've been working it in just listen to your podcast podcast. I've been working it in on, um, either trigger session days for anabolic or on, uh, I forget what they're called for aesthetic, but on the off days, uh, I've been working in some mobility exercises that way. Oh, good. Oh, that's perfect. I love that. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So as long as you're doing that, that would be my, my one concern. Um, but I love, I, a full clean is very technical. I never got good at doing a full clean. I, I look really awkward. I look like a bodybuilder trying to do it. But hang cleans, I got pretty good at. Yeah, I, I did that. And I time. loved hang cleans. Hang cleans blew my shoulders, my upper back, my traps, everything up. So it was a it was a great, great movement to uh, to add to the arsenal. So I love I love that idea. Am I right in the sense that uh, like I found doing aesthetic in phase one, um, the Romanian deadlifts really helped out my uh, deadlift um, yeah. going from day one to day two. Am I right in the sense that I probably shouldn't do if I'm going to incorporate cleans, don't do it on a day when I'm deadlifting. And will it help uh, the deadlift as well? Because right now I'm in the, the low 300s for that when I'm doing it by five. Um, I'd love to get it up to 400, uh, really push it. And that's why I'm asking any sort of hacks that I can get. It, yeah. uh, so a full a, help increase it. A full clean would. A full clean is going to help carry over the deadlift, but a full clean, a hang clean is not going to help that much with a, with a deadlift. You could try, you know, if you got your squat, to go up and you practice the hang cleans, you, you, don't be surprised if your deadlift yeah. goes up a little bit because they both have some carryover. 
Um, but I mean, it's okay. I mean, unless you're going to compete in a powerlifting competition, there's nothing wrong with not doing a deadlift and replacing it with a hand clean for a while and getting good at that and then going back to a deadlift. So if you want to get a good de- like I don't know if you've gone on a, a, a kick for a while. One of the biggest things that I saw help my deadlift this was back when I was trying to chase Sal um, was getting into heavy single leg deadlifts with dumbbells. Oh yeah. Just that that stability component and like really mm-hmm. trying to progress with that. If you go back far enough on my Instagram, you could see me doing some stuff where I jump off the ground and then balance on one leg, and then I would li- I was lifting hundred pound dumbbells. That that hip stability and strength and control that I got from doing that. Oh my god! And then when I went back to both feet on the ground and deadlifting, I felt so stable and explosive. Like that was the best I've ever felt when I was trying to get my deadlift strength up. So that's yeah, just a small tip for me. To your, to your power clean. So in um, mass performance, we actually have high pulls in their programs. And a lot of times, if people do have the work ahead of time, so they, they're a bit proficient in power cleans, we just replace those. So that's, that's one where we actually have programmed areas where you could implement it rather easily. Um, but hand clean is going to be the easiest one for you to um, probably, probably get a good handle on that. Um, quicker than you would from the floor. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the, uh, uh, carryover for deadlifts, like it, I mean, we did that. We didn't even deadlift at all. Uh, when I was, when I was, uh, training for football and was going through athletics. So, uh, it, it definitely had a bit of carryover, but like deadlifts itself takes its own focus completely. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, man. The, the hand clean thing. I love that for the trap question. That's how I, that's why I was yeah. answering that originally. So I think for like blowing your traps up and upper back, but I think for, for the, if you want a good deadlift, then there, there's other things to do. I think, you know what do. you could do, you could do a snatch grip deadlift mm-hmm. and you could do a hand clean in the same day. Snatch grip deadlift is so low. You're not going to go super heavy. It's a totally different feel. It's in map strong. Um, I love map strong and the, the hang. Yeah. The, the snatch grip deadlift was you could uh, try that that's the thing there was no shrugs and strong and i I don't think my traps got bigger than uh doing that well yeah i mean all those (laughs) a bunch of animals you could go snatch grip so let's say for if the program calls for four sets of deadlift you could do like two sets of snatch grip deadlift and one set of hang clean or two sets of hang cleans that'd be a good a good little combination okay there's nothing like that in the the maps power lift no, no. Math powerlift is very focused on deadlift, bench, and yeah. squat. Very yeah, deadlift. Yeah, there's, no, there's no, there's no everything Olympic else just compliments that. There's no explosive Olympic type lifts in that. It's literally to prepare somebody for a meet. You could, sh- you could literally follow that right into a a, a, a powerlifting meet. Right. That was why we wrote it. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right, man. Thanks for calling in, Michael. I appreciate yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Keep us posted, man. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. Take All it right. easy. Oh, the shrug question. That one pops up a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> you do get that uh, a lot. You know, it's it's really what it's it, you got to strengthen the shoulder girdle. And I'm thinking about, you know, the average person and you know, getting them good at, at strengthening that area. And it's a very low skill exercise. Most people can shrug, but there's a lot of better exercises for the traps than shrugs. They just require more skill. You yeah, know? yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. So, but I I mean he has he had some really good questions. It's just again it, when it comes to being strong in a specific lift. Yeah, it's always got to be that lift is what That's you do. Well, else. I was I, I misunderstood him originally. Like I thought he was complaining about the shrugs, and so he wanted other exercises that for the traps w- for the yeah. traps. And so that's where the whole hang clean yeah, comment was, came from me. I was trying to wrap my brain around that too. But then when he was like, will that help my deadlift? And I was like, oh, he's thinking like a full clean and thinking that that explosiveness from the floor is going to really carry over the deadlift. Not so much. Grinding strength versus speed explosiveness. Yeah. Like, you'll get, maybe get some. Oh, yeah. You, time, yeah. yeah, it's going to help with the the initial takeoff from the floor, right? So you'll get a little bit of that. But I think the, the second suggestion I gave him would be way better advice. If you haven't done single leg heavy deadlifts with dumbbells and got really good at that. Agreed. That going back to uh, then, you know, bilateral, both feet on the ground, deadlift. Well, isometric work, I mean, farmer carries will be a great addition to that as well. I mean, it, it sounds like, yeah, he hasn't gone through performance uh, and he should go through performance. Yeah. Our next caller is Jonathan from New Jersey. What's up, Jonathan? How can we help you? Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, what's, what's up, happening? Man? Not much just here. Uh, first, I want to thank you for taking my uh, my question. I appreciate you guys. You guys are like my pre-workout when it comes to life. I watch you guys a lot, so I appreciate this a lot. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. So basically, my question is, I know you guys talk about squats a lot. Um, I haven't heard you see, hear anything about low bar squatting. Um, I low bar squat a lot. I got into it a lot before I did high bar squatting. So basically, my question is, 
for low bar squatting, how do I up the weight and how do I relieve the pain? Because I can choose to get a uh, wrist pain with flexion. And my second part of the question is I also deadlift and I know both are hip dominant. So does it make sense to do both or to leave or to do one and leave the other one out? Yeah, I would look at two things. Uh, I would look at thoracic and shoulder mobility because that's what's going to help you grab the bar better. And I would look at ankle mobility because that's probably why you you go so you, you like to favor low bar. By the way, low bar, high bar, they're both great. I, I really don't care if one if a person does one or the other. Ideally, you'd want to be able to practice both of them. Uh, obviously, one's a little more upright. The other one, you're going to bend over a little bit more. Are you tall? How tall are you? No, nah, I'm a short guy. I'm only five seven. Oh, and you low bar too. Okay. What about, most guys, most like taller guys love low bar. I mean, I love low yeah. bar because of how tall, how long of levers I have. So it's much easier. For was me that how you were taught, or did that just feel more natural? I never was taught squatting, so I can kind of relate where Adam came in when I first got into lifting. I was never a leg guy. Um, if I did do legs, it was like the leg extensions, and uh, and that's really it. And some type of squatting, but I never really got into squatting. As I got older, I started getting into squatting a lot and videos. I got into like powerlifting and uh, lifting through that ways. And I started watching videos from powerlifters to squat university, uh, starting strength to like to get my squat up or just to learn it. And then from there, I just kept doing the reps and then doing low, doing low weight. And then from there, just kept going up and up. Yeah. You know, you could, yeah. you could try too, Jonathan. Do you go to a gym or do you work at a home? I go to a gym. If they have a safety squat bar, I mean, that's a great way to do a high bar squat and it's yeah. easier to get into position than, than a traditional barbell. And you could practice that. That'll keep you upright and give you kind of that high bar um, feel. Um, it's a little more quad dominant. I would say mix it up a little bit, but really the, the question you had about the wrist is you got to work more on your thoracic and shoulder yeah. mobility. Do you have MAPS Prime or MAPS Prime Pro? Yeah, wall press. Um, no, actually it's funny you say that because when I first got into low bar, I actually had, um, because I got into uh, CrossFit, um, CrossFit kind of messed me up in a sense where I was, before that I was perfectly fine after I did CrossFit and a lot of squatting, overhead squatting, um, I developed a bad hip impingement or a bad hip pain. Um, it wasn't for you guys. You actually guys taught me about the frog, um, the frog stretch and I've been doing it every day and that alleviated that. And that's one of the other reasons why I did a uh, uh, low bar because for that for low bar, it helps me help me get into a lower, a bigger depth than high bar. So I do a lot of uh, mobility work. Maybe not as much as I should be, but I try to get as much frog pressing, you know, pigeons, anything I can to alleviate that pain. I do a lot of uh, ankle uh, mobility as well. And when it comes to shoulders, I do have a, a shoulder um, harm. I, I, I hurt my shoulder a long time ago from being in the military, but I still do shoulder breakers whenever I can to try to alleviate that as yeah. well. Well, so, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you maps prime and I want you to do the wall press. Yes. So uh, it's, that's a money one for every, yeah. before I squat always, especially if I'm going to do low bar, uh, zone one, the, the wall press that Sal's talking about is money. Yeah. And you, uh, you, what's cool about it is you like go get under the bar without doing it first. So go right into your workout so you could feel where you're at and then go do it and then come back and you'll, you'll see a difference and you'll feel relief on your, on your wrist and your shoulders right yeah. away. We'll send that over to you. No, oh, man. Appreciate it. You got it, man. Thanks for calling in. Uh, thank you guys. All right, right Jonathan. Boy, that's weird, huh? CrossFit got him hurt. I was trying so hard not to say something, Sal. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. we've, made it, we've made it almost a couple of weeks without a jab. I know, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, it's I know when people talk about you know high bar, low bar. I mean, it's I think it's great to practice both. It's not a huge difference though if you like one versus the other. It's not yeah, that big, of a I especially if you do. Bar. Yeah. Look, I like low bar, and then I do front squats. I do both, and so I do both. I think there's I think there's there's I I couldn't do high bar early on. So I uh, high bar, uh, I could not get the, like he's saying, I couldn't get the depth mm -hmm. before, but that was a lot to do with my hips and my ankles. Once mm -hmm. I addressed my hips and ankles got really good. Especially ankles for me. Yeah. Now. So I actually really like, I mean, it's, it, I think it's more difficult to get in a high bar deep squat than it is a low bar. Like you, obviously sure. you have a little bit of advantage when you have a low bar to get down into a deeper squat. So oh, I like, I like that you mentioned the safety bar because like yeah. it just provides that like kind of, I don't know, it's somewhere in the middle where you do get 
um, especially if like mobility is a limitation, mm-hmm. like it helps mm-hmm. to kind of at least get that, uh, uh, you know, anterior kind of driven type of squat as well. Yeah, but I you, do that plus the front squat. But you definitely know why. I mean, he, he said he's got a shoulder issue. Yep. I mean, yeah. That's why he's not he's not able to retract all the way. Like you said, yep. thoracic yep. mobility and shoulder mobility. And he's feeling it in his wrist because his wrists are getting cranked on yeah, back they're, there. Yeah, they're compensating. But it has to do with his shoulders not being able to get all the way back. Once he gets that, you know, prime that, he'll, he'll feel a difference the first time he does it. Totally. Yep. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal.com. 